In our last study, we were looking at what repentance really means. It means a turning around, a change of mind concerning sin. Our former attitude towards sin was that we loved it and indulged in it and did it. Now we've decided to turn from it. We're not saying we have overcome. We're just saying we have changed our attitude towards it. For example, if you have a problem with your anger, repentance doesn't mean that you've stopped, you'll never get angry again. But it does mean that you don't want to get angry again. It means you don't want to lust with your eyes again. It doesn't mean you've got victory. There's a lot of difference between repentance and victory. Repentance is the first step towards victory, but it is not victory. We have to persist in going a certain way. That constant choosing makes us strong. That's why we need to have continuous repentance. In uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 2, chapter 3, the Lord speaks to the elders of seven churches. Now these are the leaders. And yet five of those leaders and their churches were so much in sin that the Lord told them to repent. To take his word seriously and repent. And to, that means to turn from the wrong that he had pointed out to them. There were things in their life that were not glorifying to God. The Lord Jesus pointed it out to them. And they were to turn from it. The Lord said to them, repent. And those are messages to Christians. Those are the last messages of Jesus to the church in Revelation. And so what is the last message of Jesus to his church in, in the book of Revelation? Repent and be an overcomer. That's the first message he preached in Matthew chapter 4 when he began his ministry. And it's the last message that he gives to the church in Revelation 2 and 3. Repent, turn, turn. Now how is it such an important subject? It's hardly ever spoken of in the Christian church today. The message of repentance is missing. We have today another gospel. A gospel without repentance. And that's a false gospel. It's a counterfeit. A gospel which encourages you to believe without repentance is a counterfeit gospel. In fact, some theologians have gone as far as to say that man cannot repent because he's so corrupt that he's not able to repent. Did God make a mistake then in urging people to repent? Did Jesus make a mistake when he told those elders to repent? Did Peter make a mistake when he told the unbelievers on the day of Pentecost to repent? No, he didn't. Don't you believe all these theologians who lead you astray from the Bible? Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. The truth is that which will set you free from the power of sin. Remember that. If something does not set you free from the power of sin, however good it may sound, it's not the truth of the gospel. Remember this too, that God never asks us to turn away from something that's good for us. Oh no, God is a good God and everything he wants to give us is for our good. If he asks us to give up something, it's something which is bad for us. Think of an earthly father. What does he tell his children to give up? He'll never tell his children to give up something that's good for them. He'll never tell them to stop eating good food. He'll never tell them to stop going to school. No. He may tell them to give up their bad friendships and certain bad habits. A good father would never, never ask his children to give up something which is good for him. 
only that which is bad. So what is God, who is a much better father, going to tell us to turn from? Things that are, can harm us. Things that can hinder us from developing to our full potential as human beings. If you want to see the full potential to which God wanted a human being to rise up to and live, you see it in the earthly life of Jesus Christ. That is how God wants you to live and me to live. There is an example there in Christ. And when I see that, I say, Lord, I want to be like that. And I want to turn, that is repent, from everything that I discover in my life, which is not like that. I want to live by the principles that Jesus lived by. And I want to turn from everything that is contrary to the principles of Jesus' life. That is repentance. And as I said last time, as we walk with the Lord, we get more and more light on what we need to turn away from. And as we turn away, we can receive from God, that is faith. Repentance is turning around. Faith is receiving from God all that God has for us. That's how we are to begin our Christian life. And that's how we are to keep on growing in the Christian life. Because as I said, repentance is something continuous. Because as long as there is something unchristlike in you, you need to repent. And we all have to acknowledge, you and I, that none of us have become perfectly like Christ yet. If that's the case, then we all need to keep on repenting. And that is the meaning of 1 John chapter 3 in relation to the second coming of Christ. It speaks here about a certain hope that we have. Now for many Christians, if you ask them, what is your hope? What is the blessed hope? Many people would say, well, that Christ will come back. But that's not all. That's only a half of it. Notice what it says in 1 John 3, 2. We know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. Notice two things here. He appears and we shall be like him. And this, it says in the next verse, is the hope. There are two parts to this hope. One is that Christ will return one half of that hope, and the second half of that hope is, I'll be like him when he returns. Did you know that? It's ignorance of the truth that prevents us to be from freedom. The truth is, the blessed hope is that Christ will come back and I will be like him. Now, it says in 1 John 3.3, 3, if this is the hope you really have, you will purify yourself just as he is pure. In other words, you'll purify yourself until you reach the standard of his holiness. We saw in our last study that the clearest definition of sin is anything unchristlike that you can see in your life. God only asks us to deal with conscious sin. I told you that repentance is something to be continuous in our life. Let me illustrate this. 90% of our inner life we cannot see. We have wrong attitudes which we are ignorant of. We have things in our life which are against God's will but we are ignorant of. All those things we can label as unconscious sin. 90% of our life we don't see. What we see is only 10%. In that area when we sin, we can say it is conscious sin. In the rest of the 90%, if I sin, and I do, and you do, it's unconscious sin. When the Bible speaks about victory over sin, it is only in that 10% area where we have light. It is impossible to get victory over unconscious sin 
till it becomes conscious. How can I overcome something which I don't even know is wrong in my life? I cannot. So we need to distinguish between these two things. Conscious sin and unconscious sin. And that is why it's so wrong to judge other people. Because if you know only 10% of your own life, how much do you think you know about other people whom you see once in a while? Less than 1%. Do you see the foolishness there of knowing 1% of a person's life and passing a judgment on him? That would be something like a judge being given a hundred pages of documents on a very important case and he reads the, just the first page and passes a judgment. Such a judge should be thrown out from the bench and yet that's what many Christians are doing. You don't know more than one percent of anybody's life. Have you judged people? Well, you've judged people whose life you know one percent. You've just seen the first out of a hundred pages of his life and you passed a judgment. That shows what an evil, wicked person you are. So it's best to stop judging other people. But there's one person about whom you know at least 10% and that's yourself. So you can start with judging yourself. And the Bible says in 1 Peter 4 that when you judge yourself, that is the proof. I'm paraphrasing it, that you're part of God's house. 